Uh, welcome to webinar Wednesday. Today we are going to be reviewing the new documentation guidelines. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Carol. I'm a registered nurse and a nursing advisor with the practice team here at the SRNA, and I'll be facilitating the webinar today. Um, our topic today is um, the documentation guidelines. We've done an update on them, uh, recently published them here in the first part of the year, and we'll just be reviewing those guidelines today. Uh, before we get started, I have a couple notes on how you can engage throughout the presentation. As a viewer of this webinar, you'll be able to see and hear the presentation, and only the panelists, myself, uh, will be able to speak throughout the presentation. If you have questions, please add them to the Q&A or the chat section. We will monitor this area for questions throughout the webinar, and these questions will be answered uh, live. And I will uh, state the question uh, prior to giving the answer, just so that everybody knows what I'm speaking of. Uh, if you wish to send a question anonymously, just check the box at the bottom of the Q&A screen. We will be recording this webinar and it may be posted to the SRNA website for those who are unavailable to join today to view at a later time. An email will be sent to you following the webinar with a link to an evaluation. We hope you take a couple of minutes to complete this quick survey. So now that the housekeeping items are out of the way, we'll get started. Okay, so first I'd like to uh, acknowledge, um, uh, our, do our land acknowledgement, sorry. As we gather here today, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10, and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and the Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. So as I said, at the beginning, we'll be reviewing the documentation guideline today. If at any time you have questions, please just pop them into the Q&A. I probably won't get back to them until the end of the presentation, but I will um, attempt to answer all questions. Okay, so something that's new in our documents is a section on regulatory authority. We'll be moving towards a single mandate of uh, strictly a regulatory body come this fall. And so now our documents are going to reflect a little bit of a different taste. We'll be including our RN practice standards and our RN entry-level competencies, or if it's an NP um, document, it'll be the NP practice standards and the NP entry-level competencies. You may also, if the document covers both um, categories, you may see uh, both sets of practice standards and entry-level competencies um, that are most applicable to the document um, contained within that document. It doesn't mean that these are the only practice standards or ELCs that apply to the documentation, the ones that are currently in this uh, new format. Um, there are other ones that apply, but we have chosen what we feel is the most applicable um, standards and ELCs for our documents. All RNs and NPs are, to, are required to follow their practice standards, entry-level competencies, and the code of ethics. So let's go through this. Why do RNs document? First of all, it's means of communication. It's an exchange of client health information between the members of the healthcare team, not just nurses, but also physicians, uh, physiotherapists, pharmacists, you know, any other healthcare professional you can think of, all document in the client chart, and it is a form of communication. It also reflects our professional uh, judgment, assessment, coordination of care, decisions, actions, and evaluations. And this is our professional accountability. Uh, our personal liability is another reason that we document. Uh, patient chart is a legal dog, sorry, document and can be used as evidence in legal proceedings to reconstruct the sequence of events related to their care, to establish a date and timeline of when the care was provided, uh, may serve to refresh the memory of those who are involved in the client care should they have to potentially go to court and to substantiate or resolve conflicts in testimony. And this could be at uh, the legal level. It could also be if there was perhaps a complaint filed against 
um, a registered nurse, um, the care is a documented patient record could be called as part of the evidence for that type of a situation. Um, the documentation confirms that the nursing care provided was competent and safe and met the established standards of care, was provided promptly and in a manner that is consistent with organizational policies. Okay, why do RNs document? There's several reasons. Um, one could be for quality improvement and risk management and accreditation. Um, documentation is used to measure, um, to reduce risks to client, visitors, staff, and organizations. Nursing documentation provides data for risk management and quality improvement tools for both the RN and the employer, and most especially the patient. Accreditation provides hospital healthcare agencies with an independent third-party assessment of the organization using standards built upon best practices used and validated by organizations. And this process is used to accept, to assess what is consistently being done well and uh, areas for improvement. Funding and resource management documentation supports the allocation of resources, workload measurement, fiscal utilization, including human and physical resources. Uh, it also helps to uh, inform practice through research. Data gathered from client records provides an abundant source of information related to nursing interventions and evaluations of client outcomes. And then this data is then used to determine the efficiency and effectiveness of client care provided. All right, who should document? Legal and professional principles dictate that our, the RN who provided client care should be the individual who documents on the client's health record. Third-party documentation can lead to errors or inaccuracies in the client record, and that may affect the provision of safe and competent care for the client. In the case of litigation, documentation that is completed by a third party may not be admissible in court proceedings or the credibility of the documentation may be called into question. Um, Another uh, part of third-party documentation, it's not prudent practice. Although it's not prudent practice, there are situations where third-party documentation may be appropriate and agency policy should clearly outline under what circumstances a third party may document for another care provider. Some of these situations include uh, code blue, there would be a designated recorder, auxiliary staff, perhaps unprovide, sorry, unregulated care providers and individuals who are employed by external organizations can only document in the client's health record if agency policy supports this practice. So if a family decided to perhaps hire a private duty nurse, um, there would have to be an agreement, something in writing that um, this person from an outside agency would be able to document in the client record. And if that situation should occur in your workplace, you need to check to see what agency policy is in order to continue that communication regarding patient care. Uh, sometimes a client or family member may be asked to record their observations or some component of care in order to optimize the health outcomes of the client and inform the ongoing assessment of the client's health needs. This could be newborn output, how many wet diapers, uh, perhaps fluid intake for a client that is um, uh, suffering some dehydration, you're trying to encourage fluids, you may have them document how much they're taking in each time. Nursing students also have a responsibility to document the care that they provide. Um, they are to follow agency policy and academic policies regarding this type of documentation. Uh, the SRNA does not support co-signing of documentation completed by students. Uh, if there was perhaps a discrepancy, um, it might be a learning opportunity, uh, but students are responsible for what they document. Okay, so how should RNs document? Um, it should be legible and spelling should be correct. Um, it's hard to communicate with other people uh, by reading the patient record if it's if the writing is illegible or if the spelling is incorrect. Incorrect spelling sometimes can lead to um, some significant errors. 
the use of abbreviations. Uh, agencies usually publish their own list of what are approved abbreviations. Uh, you can follow up with your employer. Um, also, um, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, ISMP, also has a list of um, error, error prone abbreviations. So you may want to check with them. Uh, blank spaces or white spaces, there should be none uh, within your documentation. If you've finished uh, your entry and there's still a gap between where you finished writing and the edge of the page, ensure you stroke through and draw that line through there that's an, so that no one can come along after and add um, any sort of uh, extra um, information that could be incorrect or could affect your uh, document. Errors or changes in documentation, um, they should be corrected according to agency policy for accuracy. So again, check with the employer to see what, uh, what their policy is. And uh, you don't want it to appear that you falsified the record. So again, this also goes hand in hand with the blank spaces. You don't want a blank space and somebody adding something after or you know, adding something yourself that may not be accurate. When you're correcting documentation, the incorrect information must remain visible or retrievable in the case of electronic charting uh, so that the purpose and the content of the correction is understood. Uh, do not make any entries in between lines. It's difficult to read and can lead to errors and shows that there's perhaps some falsification going on. Do not remove anything from the client records, such as monitor strips or lab reports. Those need to remain intact. Do not use correction tape or stickers to hide or obliterate the error. Um, never remove page, pages from the client record. If there is an error and you need to start a new page, it's best just to draw a line through the rest of the page so that nobody else adds anything and then start your page. But it must remain with the client record. Cross through the word or words with a single line above the entry and write mistaken entry. And this may vary according to agency policy. So it is important that you check and see how the employer wants um, changes made to the client record. You also need to include your initials, date, and the time that the correction was made to the client record. Um, in the case of, say, a client record that got somebody spilled their coffee on it or you know, spilled water on it or something like that, you need to keep those pages as well. Um, you don't throw them into the garbage or rewrite them or anything like that. You keep them with the client record. How should RNs document? Confidentiality uh, is something that we all hear about on a consistent basis. We have legislation, HIPAA, which directs us uh, regarding confidentiality. RNs must maintain the privacy and confidentiality of all client health records, regardless what the method of documentation is, whether you're writing longhand in a chart or it's electronic, it needs to be kept secure and out of the prying eyes of those people that are don't need to have any access to it. Um, and RNs should only access the records of clients currently in their care. Uh, Electronic documentation is becoming more and more prevalent, um, and it follows the same principles as paper-based documentation. There can be additional safeguards for use on the computer, such as encryption, so a special code you may have to um, enter before you can actually get into the client record. These types of things are driven by employer policy, so again, check with your employer. Um, create strong passwords and change them frequently. Oftentimes there's a 60 or 90 day period or every 60 or 90 days, you may have to change your password. Don't share your password or any other access information with others. Um, ensure you log off or lock the screen when you leave uh, the terminal, just so that somebody else isn't making entries under your name. Uh, protect the monitor from visualization by others when making entries into the client records. Uh, report unauthorized access or use of your electronic signature. So ensure that uh, the notes that are going in are in fact supposed to be coming from you, that they're not being put in by someone else. And do not log on for someone else. Um, all people that need to have access to 
the electronic record should have their own um, passwords and uh, uh, encryption codes and things like that in order to get in. Uh, RNs must maintain the, comp the privacy and confidentiality of client records regardless what method of documentation used. Client information should only be shared with those directly involved in the client. What should RNs document? And I think we mostly know this, but sometimes um, in you know things busy at work, we sometimes forget. Um, so we'll just review this as well. We need to document all aspects of the nursing process, which includes assessment, planning, implementation, and evaluation. We need to document objectively what we see, what we can touch, what we can quantify, not subjective statements. Subjective statements uh, usually are not helpful in a client record. RNs should document all aspects of client care using, utilizing the nursing process and using objective statements, avoid vague or opinionated documentation, avoid generalizations and bias or labels towards the client, towards their family, that type of information should not be included in the client record. Your date, time and signature and your designation all need to be included in uh, your documentation. Admission, transfer, uh, transport and discharge information um, all need to be documented. They provide a baseline for future care for a client. So receiving agencies or receiving units need to have that information. And then healthcare team collaboration, communications that occur among the members of the healthcare team must be recorded in the client record and everyone should do their own documentation. Okay. What should RNs document? Another emerging area is telepra sorry, telepractice and especially with COVID-19, there has been a definite increase in telepractice, care which is care delivered by electronic means you must use good communication skills and ask probing questions to gather information, the signs and symptoms that the client is experiencing. So you, because you can't put hands on, you need to ask some pretty descriptive probing questions so that you can elicit the information you need. In some cases, there's a specific protocol or algorithm uh, for decision-making. What should the client do? How can you direct them? As with all care, consent for care needs to be obtained and this needs to be documented in the client record that you received consent and all information provided including client consent needs to be accurately and thoroughly documented in the client record. Another thing that needs to be documented is client education it can be the materials and methods used, the family involvement, the client's understanding. Those are all important aspects to include in the client record. Okay, I think this slide is out of place, but I, I know I haven't covered it yet. So anyways, I'll cover it now. Uh, which should RNs document? Things like risk-taking behaviors. When clients choose to engage in risk-taking behaviors or refuse medical care or advice, it's vital that the RN document the information that was provided to the client and the outcome of the discussion with the client in a fair and unbiased manner. Again, no subjective uh, comments, biases, or labels, just uh, what was observed, uh, the discussion, and then the client's choice. Any adverse events or incident reports, um, they should be objectively recorded as well. Um, and the care that was provided, the RN should avoid the use of words such as error, incident, or accident when documenting. Assumptions, conclusions, and judgments about the event should not be included in the documentation. And most agencies do have specific reporting forms for adverse events and for incident reports. So check with your employer. And um, if you're not sure how to fill them out, ask a colleague so that you make sure that you capture all pertinent information. All right, so when should RNs document? RNs should document frequently, chronologically, and promptly. Uh, it's best, your memory is best, and you know, circumstances on the unit that you're working on, it's best to get that information down right away because there's many things going on and you're 
you know, a couple hours later, your, your recall may not be as clear as it was, you know, at the time of uh, when the care was uh, done. All documentation should be completed according to agency policy. Chronological entries into the client's health record are important as they re reveal patterns and changes in the client's health status. So another reason to document uh, frequently is that you get that ongoing picture of exactly what the client's status is. Chronological entries provide for clear communication of the client's status and the care provided. RNs should document assessments, interventions, evaluation, treatment, or care provided in a timely manner. Um, sometimes things happen. Uh, we forget to document something, and it could be several hours later, it could be a day later, but we know we have to make this entry. So in that case, uh, we put it in as a late entry and we identify it as a late entry. Um, to, uh, again, check with agency policy to see what the, uh, how the entry should be made, but the new entry must be clearly identified as a late entry. And I know I have quotations around there and you don't have to put the quotations, I'm just doing that for emphasis. Um, you need to specify the date and time that the new note was entered and then clearly identify the event or previous note that the new entry is related to. And that's, is there any questions? I'm willing to take questions now. Okay, so I have a question here. Is it mandatory to do a late entry? If the care that was provided is, I would say yes. The short answer is yes. If you've provided care, uh, to that client, all care should be documented. So if, yes, you should do that. You should make a late entry. Sometimes it's difficult, you know, your recall may not be as good. You need to document the information you do remember. And if you identify it as a late entry, then, you know, and refer it back to the care that happened uh, previously, then you should, uh, you should be safe then. Uh, we have a comment here uh, or question. I'm, I'm not entirely certain. Um, past education provided by SRNA stated that let late entries were at the nurse's discretion. If it affects patient care or it is patient care has been provided, then it needs to be documented in the client record. Okay, I have one here. Will you be speaking to charting by exception? Uh, charting by exception is usually uh, an employer policy. Um, I know of a few situations where I've worked where it has, uh, it's been the agency policy to chart by exception. I'm not sure what kind of uh, setting you're working in. Um, I know that NIS, um, and I don't know if NIS is still used, I'll be quite honest about that. Uh, that was supposed to provide for charting by exception. But if you're providing hands-on patient care and there's something that's notable, it should be documented. If you don't, if you don't make those uh, doc, if you don't document those, I'm sorry, I'm babbling here. If you don't document those uh, instances of care, how can you see if there's any sort of a trend or anything happening to the patient? Does that help? You can just give me a yes or no or a thumbs up. Uh, yes, we do not teach staff to write uh, mistaken entry. We instruct them to write void. Instead, is this accept acceptable? And you don't use any words associated with errors, which is great. And void is fine as well. The entry does no longer, it no longer applies. There's been further documentation. Uh, that has been added to the patient chart that clarifies that mistaken entry or void. So that would work fine as well. Okay. There have been many questions regarding how students are expected to document. Most agencies use a checklist for initial assessment. One program is, re sorry, preferring that students do not use this document. They expect students to document longhand not on the form. This is time consuming. 
does the SRNA have any direction for how this initial assessment should be done so we could have consistency around the province? Unfortunately, the SRNA, other than saying don't co-sign um, student entries, the it's between the agency, but like the, the school and the employer as to how that documentation is going to be done. I'm not sure which program you're referring to. Um, it may be something to take back to the employer to see if there could uh, be discussion between the uh, educational institutions and the employer, the SHA, I'm assuming mostly, um, there could be some discussion so that they could uh, put this down in writing somewhere that's for some consistency. I'm not sure what year students um, these are. Uh, it may be they're in sort of their first or their second year, and that's asked why they're asking to document longhand. They want to see if they can actually document what they're seeing as opposed to a checklist. But it might be time to gather the relevant parties, the employer and the educational institutions, and try and develop some sort of policy around consistency for how students are going to document. Uh, with charting by exception, does within normal limits have to be recorded in the agency record? That's an interesting question. Um, charting by exception. Within normal limits is so it is vague to begin with. Um, if that's what the employer has provided for you, though, as a, you know, a checklist type of thing, charting by exception, um, I suppose that would work. Um, I would check, again, that's employer policy charting by exception. You would have to check with them if they feel that within normal limits is descriptive enough, then, then yes, I would say so. Okay. So writing error with a strike through is not appropriate. Mistaken entry or void must be used. Yes, that would be best practice, not error. Okay, and do you have a document outlining documentation guidelines from the SRNA that you can share with us? Actually, if you go to our website um, and you click on practice and then um, RN resources, um, there's a, there's a, a section there. It says um, register nurse practice resources. Click on the read more tab, and in there, under the second heading, would be the documentation guidelines. It's right at the top of the list. Okay. Does anybody have any more questions? I hope I answered everybody's questions. If not, please feel free to give me a, a call here at the SRNA. I'd love to have a discussion with you. Okay, I've just got another one here. I find it interesting that the documentation guidelines refer only to care provided, but do not speak to documentation of the plan of care. I realize the incompetencies include the requirement to have a plan of care, but we struggle so much with nurses not updating care plans. And yes, I have heard that is very much a concern. It was a concern when I was still practicing at the bedside uh, myself. Uh, that's something that the employer would have to uh, address. Um, it is a requirement, it's part of the competencies. There are, I would start with low level resolution and taking it to your employer. Um, if it's something that's problematic and I'm not looking to drum up work for us or complaints and investigations, but if it's something that is problematic, uh, it might be time that uh, uh, a complaint is made through complaints and investigations. Anything for anyone else? I really appreciate all these questions. This is great. Fantastic. Do we have guidelines for care plans? No, we don't. Okay. So if there's nothing else, I just have uh, one more slide here. 
Um, just some takeaway questions for yourself. Um, so in questions, takeaways for yourself after today's webinar. Uh, what's your biggest takeaway from the webinar? What connection do you see between the standards, entry-level competencies, and code of ethics and the information presented? And I know somebody already mentioned, sort of mentioned the entry-level competencies. And are you able to apply the information presented in your current practice? So you don't have to get back to me with that. It's just things to think about. I hope uh, what was presented was um, interesting, informative. Again, if you have any other questions, you can certainly contact us at the SRNA. And I'm just gonna put up a poll question. I'd appreciate um, everyone answering it, if you don't mind. Um, and the question is, did the webinar provide information on resources to support your practice of safe, competent, ethical, and culturally appropriate care? And for anybody that you know would like further discussion, as I said, be, feel free to contact us. I'd be happy to have a discussion with anyone. Uh, just to let you know, 89% of you were got what you needed from this uh, presentation. 11% didn't. Um, as I said, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to contact me here at the SRNA or any one of the practice advisors, and we'd be happy to have a discussion. Okay, and I think that's it. Have a great day, everybody.